Hey everybody, it's Dr. Cody Rawl with Tech First Psych. This is part two of my two-part series on the Muse Practitioner's Guide. If you haven't already, click subscribe and hit that bell to get notifications when I upload new content. If you guys are interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, go to www.techforpsych.com slash coaching. Hope you enjoy. Okay, everybody, so this is part two of my tutorial on the Muse Practitioner's Guide, and it starts out very perfectly with Muse Connect. This is an online platform that a provider can log into and see a dashboard of all the different clients they have floating around out there, whether that be from you know personal clientele or patients that they're seeing in the office, et cetera. Got all these different Muse headsets out there, all these people engaging in mindfulness and getting their metrics right there and it really simplifies the whole process. And like I said before, we've never before in history had this ability to get EEG in the home to use for neurofeedback, have that data go to the smartphone, be reported to the internet to allow the provider to review it from home. And uh, it's really gonna revolutionize, I think, this practice of having access to different things that use operant conditioning, which is the main side psychological process with the neurofeedback to help shape our minds, to help shape uh, not only our ability to meditate, but uh, also ability to concentrate and a lot of other things coming down the line. So super exciting. This page is talking about Muse in clinical practice, and I think that they very wisely state in the beginning paragraph, although that this practitioner's guidebook is a guide for using Muse, it's more of like a scaffolding for you to figure out what works for you and your clients. And uh, I think that what a provider will find is that use of Muse really varies depending on what population you're using it with. Um, they break it down into treatment augmentation, treatment focus, experimental use, and emotional self-regulation. And below each one of those headlines, they kind of give examples. So for treatment augmentation, I've seen is when I use it in like an intensive outpatient program. Uh, you know, these are patients that need a lot of help and they need to take time out of work and they're really trying to uh, get back to the point where they're emotionally stable enough to get back to a regular routine. And I think that in those situations, uh, you know, basically shoving meditation or the muse down their throat is not the necessarily the best way to go. They kind of have to come to it. And in the modules of the program, uh, mindfulness is a big key, but there's also things like, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy thinking, um, journaling, a lot of other tools that go along with the whole course. And what I like to do is, along with the mindfulness module, sort of introduce Muse as a treatment augmentation. So it's not the main focus of the course, but it helps them kind of get interested in meditation and start doing it regularly, hopefully. Now, I can't force people to do meditation regularly in those types of programs because they have the choice of what parts of the program they want to engage in. But it's, it's a nice thing to have there to peak interest and uh, get them uh, hopefully meditating on a more regular basis. Uh, the second one, treatment focus, would be more like my private clients that come to me through Tech for Psych. Um, these are people that are typically uh, seeking specific meditation training using the Muse because uh, you know, I've been talking about the power of you know saving time, working with the provider. It's kind of like doing these uh, genetic tests for metabolism these days. You can kind of see what uh, foods your body is optimized for, or genetic testing for medications they're having now. So it's getting more towards personalized medicine. That would be more the treatment focus. The people that have been screened specifically for wanting meditation training, specifically with Muse, that becomes a treatment focus. Uh, experimental use, I've definitely seen people use Muse for experimental purposes. Uh, my old mentor uh, is currently using it, uh, taking a look at acupuncture. So uh, using acupuncture and seeing the change in the brain waves before and after sessions, Muse can definitely be used in practice uh, for that. Uh, I find it interesting, the last paragraph, the emotional self-regulation part, uh, it talks about maybe stopping a session in the middle of uh, a patient being very upset and, and using the Muse to sort of calm them down. Now, I have to admit that I have not done that specifically. Uh, I've had you know people stop and take deep breaths, but um, I commend the person that it's really using Muse to that full effect in emergency medicine. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do that now or not, but uh, I would say that I have not actually engaged in that part. But the rest I've seen for sure. More treatment augmentation and uh, programs where people sort of need to be there but aren't necessarily interested in mindfulness. 
uh, but you're trying to pique their interest, treatment focus for more specialized patients that come through specialized mediums like my tech for psych YouTube page and experimental use for any other modalities that you want to do, whether that be acupuncture, relaxation training, or other studies that you're doing at the hospital or clinic. That's of course uh, approved by the, the hospital uh, internal review board. So this next page talks about introducing the muse to the client. And I can't stress how important this step actually is because if you can imagine, uh, one of the barriers is taking the time to actually sit down and meditate. That's one of the biggest barriers that prevents people from engaging in a regular meditative practice. If they have an additional technology barrier to get over, to get to even that point, they're just not going to do it. So you really need to take the time with them in the office to show them how to put on the headset, make sure that they have a smartphone that can uh, get the Bluetooth connected, uh, download the app for them in the clinic if you can, and open up the app. Uh, help them log in and create an account. Maybe you can have them sit there and do that while you're typing up your note or something so that you can save a little time during your day. And then show them how to launch a session and uh, basically just get them set up so that when they get home, they can just immediately start meditating. Because like I said, these little barriers are big barriers because setting a new habit is very difficult. And a lot of times people will find the smallest excuse not to engage in a regular practice. So if you can sit them down in the session and really show them how it works and not give them excuses of like, oh, I couldn't get my Bluetooth to connect or my smartphone wouldn't download the app or I couldn't find the app in the app store. Uh, unless they're you know specifically selected clients that are coming in that are really motivated. But if you're using it with regular clients in the office, a lot of times you're going to need to sort of push them over that hump by making sure that they're well set up before they leave the office. So super important, make sure you sit down and take the time to do this so the rest of the uh, training module is successful. And if you have the time, maybe even to have them do a session in the office, I think that would be like ultimate. So, uh, you know, how much ever time you can afford in your busy schedule to actually have them do a full session, but at least get set up with the technology is super important. All right, so you've got the client in your office or maybe you're doing a one-on-one -on -one Skype call. They've got the muse, they're ready to go with their meditation program. How do you start out that conversation? How do you introduce them to mindfulness? Well, it will depend on their level of experience with mindfulness. You could start out with talking about the mind-body connection, how the mind has a lot of power over the physiological functions of the body through the central nervous system and that the more that you get attuned with that, the better that you can do things like emotional self-regulation uh, and other coping skills that allow people to stay calm, centered, and present in stressful situations. These days, I like to talk about the brain connectome quite a bit. Uh, you know, we've got these different networks in the brain, and depending on where your attention is, you can turn on and off different brain networks. Uh, there's one like the default mode network that has a lot to do with self-referential thought, and then people that have high levels of depression and anxiety often get stuck in the default mode network, so we want to turn on different brain circuits to allow your attention to be elsewhere. Um, I like here where they talk about demystifying meditation. Uh, they talk about mindfulness doesn't mean trying to force yourself to think of nothing. Rather, it's about becoming an investigator, a playful observer of your own mind. And I like that a lot. I, I like to have that concept, but also talk about curiosity. It's like developing a curiosity in yourself of, you know, when, for instance, if you're focusing on your breath, noticing how each little breath was different than the last in temperature and taste and the amount that you inhaled and it's developing that sort of curiosity, I think, that can really get people deeper into a meditative state. One of the things I like to do when I start off with a client is ask them, you know, what are their thoughts of mindfulness or what do they expect to get out of meditation? And that will tell you so much about their understanding or their uh, conception of what meditation is. So you can use that and help shape uh, the, the sessions from there on out. I just had a client that started that spoke about uh, fine-tuning his thoughts and gaining a deeper understanding of why he was here um, and doing a better job of pattern recognition within his own thought process. So I did feel like that was a little superficial in terms of understanding meditation, but it was a great starting off point of uh, saying, hey, well, you know, there's that, and then we can you know, dive deeper as we go on week to week. And the other part of this page is talking about what I spoke about on the previous page is that you should definitely take some time, go over and use the Muse with them uh, during the initial visit if you have the time because those little technological hurdles will become big hurdles if a patient is you know, not super motivated to get into the meditations, especially in uh, groups that aren't 
doing this as a mandatory thing, I think it's really important to what, you know, sort of baby step them through using the device with the phone because it can still be pretty intimidating with, for uh, a good amount of the population to be using Bluetooth devices and wearables. So that part is really important. So in the next session, you want to check in with your client, obviously, and hopefully in between sessions, you're using Muse Connect to take a look at their data and make sure that they are meditating. If they're not doing the regular sessions, you can reach out to them via email and give them a little positive reinforcement to uh, you know, keep, keep up with their meditative practice. When they come into the office or when you meet with them over Skype call, review their data. Um, and I like to first just make sure that there weren't any major technological hurdles for them. You know, is the device seeming like it's connecting to your phone okay? Is it the calibration phase going okay? And what did you think about doing the sessions? And that's where it'll get into them talking about uh, it was either easier or more difficult than they thought it would be. And they'll probably have questions on the data. What are these recovery points? And, you know, I was trying to get more birds and whenever the birds would come, I would get excited and they would fly off. This is something that I get all the time from my clients. So, you know, kind of ex exploring those different ideas, honing that and getting that back to the idea of meditation and how this is uh, helping them develop that ability to have relaxed attention while they meditate. It's just such a rich conversation because there's so many different data points to talk about and uh, really get them excited and uh, addicted to continue the meditative process. So it's always fun to have clients come back after they've been meditating for a week or two with the device and talk about the data and what they experienced. And like I said, a very fruitful conversation usually. And after that initial session, when they come back, you can really start building on that and going to higher levels of understanding. So you can highlight key focus areas in terms of like, did they notice any trends about what they felt or what they experienced during the meditation? Were they getting distracted externally? Were they get, getting distracted internally? What insights did they have or did they have any breakthroughs in which they experienced something subjectively that they hadn't before in terms of, you know, did they feel more centered or grounded or was their anxiety level reduced for the first time in months? All these are different areas of uh, topic of conversation that you can engage as these sessions go on. Here they have a nice guide or suggestion of how you might use Muse with your clients from week to week. Uh, the first week would just be you know, three to five minute sessions, getting used to the technology, being introduced to these concepts, and really just becoming more comfortable with uh, meditating with Muse on a daily practice. And uh, week two to four is getting more into uh, longer sessions, you know, five to 10 minutes. I, I would recommend at least 10 minutes daily. You're setting goals, you're reviewing their data throughout the week, and then in session with them to engage in these data-informed, fruitful conversations for meditation and help them and you learn at the same time. And definitely pretty early on in the week-to-week -week meditation basis, I would recommend them doing Muse Essentials meditation course, which is actually in the app itself. I think it's really a great uh, primer for talking about meditation and having them learn from session to session as they give little talks before and after the meditation sessions. And then week four to eight, you really want to increase the meditation time again, maybe up to 20 minutes a day, and really start to dive into how they can use these concepts from meditation in their daily lives to be more centered, productive, and capable people. So in this page, they start talking about different mental health disorders that Muse could augment treatment for. And I think generalized anxiety disorder is a great place to start out with. It's a very common disorder, one of the most common ones in the world in terms of mental health conditions. Um, one of the things about anxiety is that people get so many different thoughts and emotions that overwhelm them and get them stuck in that brain circuit, the default mode network, that introspective brain circuit network that makes it difficult for them to be uh, present and at peace. Whereas the meditation can teach them to bring that out, to, to get out of that uh, repetitive thought process and be more comfortable experiencing everyday emotions and be exposed to the real world and sort of handle that anxiety a little bit better. In the next page, they talk a little bit about chronic pain. I think chronic pain is one of the worst conditions that I'm aware of. I've just seen people completely consumed by it. Um, obviously, there's a lot of inflammation and neuronal signals that are coming from uh, the body to the brain that is real, but uh, the emotional component can make it that much worse. So you're having some pain, but then you tense up emotionally and then you focus and perseverate on the pain, it can make it so much worse. And I think that meditation can help people sort of untangle that relationship and gain a little space from the pain, allowing them to manage their emotions a little bit better related to the pain. And as I said before, you can combine different meditative techniques to the muse 
um, program, such as like a body scan or a progressive muscle relaxation. And you can do that before or after the calibration phase of when you're doing the sessions with the Muse. Here's some nice case studies here from Michael DeCare that you can read about that illustrate some good outcomes that can come with using Muse with patients. I won't uh, talk intelligently about these specific cases because I didn't experience them directly, but uh, feel free to go through them and find good examples of uh, what a successful case augmentation treatment with Muse would look like. So I'm using practice. They suggest having some devices in your office for clients to try out. I think it's great because people really only can understand what you're talking about in terms of the technology when they actually try it. And that's why I try to introduce the technology early in the hospital programs that I'm involved in that I'm using Muse with because I want people to get that early exposure so it can peak interest early, have them get comfortable with the technology, and then hopefully get into a meditative practice. They talk about some different research at the end here, some really cool early clinical studies and then some machine learning of uh, new EEG characteristics that we didn't know existed until this the technology got democratized from Interaxon. My personal favorite here is the evoked reaction potential study, the measurements that validate the EEG signal for the mobile EEG for all the doubters out there. And uh, one that's really cool here is integrating virtual reality with EEG technology. And I think we're gonna be seeing more of that as this technology progresses. And some final resources here that include a Muse logbook that you can use with your clients and a case study submission form if you want to submit something to Interaxon for their continued research with the Muse headband. Okay, so that rounds up my talk on the Muse Professionals Guidebook. I hope you got something out of it. I hope that it was valuable for you. Again, um, be sure to go on Facebook and subscribe to the Tech for Psych Facebook page and check out the website and subscribe to the YouTube channel. I so much appreciate all you guys uh, following me over the last couple of years here, and uh, we're only going to go further. So it's Dr. Cody Rall with Tech for Psych signing off.